Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters, and it is my privilege today to have as my guest, David J. Halperin. David, welcome to the podcast. Well, I am so honored to be here, John. Thank you for having me. Well, I, I can't think of a better way to introduce you than I'll read the uh, the bio from the, the dust cover of your latest book that's going to be the topic of our conversation today. It says, David Halperin taught Judaic studies in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, until his retirement in 2000. He has published five nonfiction books on Jewish mysticism, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, Messianism, Perfect. Messianism, eh, people get it, <laughs> as well as the coming of age uh uh, novel Journal of a UFO Investigator from 2011. He blogs about, blogs about UFOs religion, related subjects at davidhalpern.net. And of course, we'll put this information in the uh, program notes for folks to take a look at. And we're going to be talking today, we're going to be adding to our playlist uh, on uh, the paranormal with another exploration of the UFO phenomenon, coming at this from a different angle. By way of David's uh, book, Intimate Alien, The Hidden Story of the UFO. And I'm excited about uh, looking at this. Before I ask my first question, David, I need to connect some dots between you and I. I part of why I find your story and this book and this approach fascinating is uh, we're, you're a little older than I am. I'm a child of the 70s, and I was a, a UFO investigator in the 1970s. I was a member of MUFON. And wow. I don't know how many documentaries and pseudo documentaries I saw during that time period. It, as you know, the television was just full of them. Uh, I saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind in the theaters at least 30 times. I enjoyed that far more than Star Wars. It just struck a chord for me. Um, and like you early on, uh, I kind of held to um, what we might call the nuts and bolts theory. These were extraterrestrials. But over time, I just found the evidence not only not there, but counterproductive to that interpretation. But what I became fascinated in is not, uh, I'm not interested in the two poles, either the true believer or the skeptic who debunks everything, although th th those things you know, are important to look at. I'm interested in what does it mean for human beings? And yeah. that's where your approach comes in, looking at it through the lens of mythology. So I, I think we have some common elements uh, in our two stories there. To begin, can you share a little bit about your story? How, how did UFOs become so meaningful to you when you were younger? Well, a friend, uh, it was a friend of mine and I in eighth grade were doing an extra credit project for a science class. And I remember we rode our bicycles out to the public library in Levittown, Pennsylvania. And we opened an artifact that not all of your listeners have ever seen. That is a card catalog. And <laughs> we, yes, we, were, we were going, we were writing about life on other planets. And we thought, well, you know, some people say they're already here in flying saucers. So we looked up flying saucers. And uh, under the subject of flying saucers, there were three entries. There are three cards in the catalog. There was one called Behind the Flying Saucers, which I don't expect to talk about anymore. Uh, there was one by a certain C.G. Jung, Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies. And there was Gray Barker. They knew too much about flying saucers. And I, 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 I was assigned as part of our preparation to read Gray Barker's book. And I took it home and I started reading it. And pretty soon, I was so scared, I wanted to hide under the bed. That it starts out with an account of a seven-foot monster that landed with a glowing UFO on a hilltop in West Virginia in 1952. And then it goes on to 
the story of a UFO investigator named Albert K. Bender, who in 1953 was visited by three men in black suits that he had discovered the secret of the flying saucers and the three men in black came to visit him and terrified him into silence. Now, this story, which when I tell it, seems utterly fantastic, seemed to me intuitively true. And I can tell you, looking back in retrospect, why it impressed me as intuitively true. That is that I knew the three men in black personally, that they were part of my experience that in our home, there was a terrible secret. The secret being that my mother was not merely a semi-invalid, as the official story in our family went, but that she was slowly dying of heart disease which we simply could not talk about. So that the three men in black served to me, and I only understood this decades afterward, they served to me as an emblem of what I knew from my experience was reality. Okay, and if the three men in black existed, if they were real, then it followed that the flying saucers had to be real. And if I wanted to break the silence, as unconsciously I yearned to do, then the thing to do was to become a flying saucer investigator to which I dedicated the remainder of my high, junior high and high school years. And then I went off to college and of course had to set all this aside and instead became a specialist in the wheels of the prophet Ezekiel. <laughs> now, all this I'm telling you with the insight of retrospect. And it was afterwards, or I really should say about from about 1970 on, after I'd graduated from, co from, from college, that I began to take another look at that other book that we found in the library. Jung's Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Skies, which I had tried to read at the same time I read Gray Barker, and I understood it about as well as any 12-year-old can be expected to understand Carl Jung, which is I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> and I completely misinterpreted modern myth to mean he's saying, oh, it's just myth, it's just nothing, It's there's no truth in it. I didn't grasp at the time that for Jung, myth was the profoundest and most important of truths. And I would date, I would date my opening of eyes to Jung from 1970, when I met a man at, St at Stanford University named Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. And we, anyone who deals with UFOs knows the name of Jacques Vallée. And those who watch, who've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, have, of course, seen 
his representative on the screen. I can't. Do you remember the name of the French scientist in uh, in Close Encounters? Oh, I, I know the actor was the director uh, Francois Truffaut, but I don't recall his name. I should. I've seen it enough. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean that that, that character was was modeled after Jacques Vallée, and that Vallée had shortly before published a major book on UFOs, Passport to Magonia, in which he compared UFOs and the little men in UFOs to the little men of folklore, not with an intent of disparaging UFOs, but suggesting that all of these things point to some sort the the the, the, the UFOs, the fairy tales, the myths of various kind point to a reality that we need to explore sympathetically. And I realized that Jung was as good a guide as any to exploring it. Now, you've, you've mentioned books that were important, that connected to things subconsciously in your own life. And obviously, there were UFO sightings as a UFO investigator that you're keeping track of. Was, was there anything else in pop culture, or were those the primary driving forces for you? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm watching yeah. documentaries hosted by Rod Serling, and of course, anything connected to Twilight Zone for me uh had to be taken seriously i'm reading eric von daniken you know but again this was a, a little bit later than what you you were early in the phenomenon is right yeah my my uh my ufologist days with the 1960s von mm -hmm. daniken published i think in the mid 70s mm -hmm. yeah and i think by then when when I became aware of von Däniken, uh, I thought uh, it, it didn't appeal to me because then I no longer was attached to the idea of UFOs being actual visitors from from outer space. One of the things I appreciate, I've like I said, I think before we started, I've watched a number of your your podcasts uh, on other guests, being a guest on other podcasts. I saw you with uh, Michael Shermer, and I think, uh, I, I don't know if he identified you as this or this was a self-identification, you're a skeptic. But what I appreciate about your position is that I, I read you in that interview as being a little more open to to possibilities than, than Michael might be. I appreciate the skeptical approach, but I appreciate what you bring to it with some openness. Now, when you use the term myth as modernists, people think myth equals, it's just not true. It's just fairy tales. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about, what do you mean when you talk about myth? I, 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 I see myth as a collective dream, at least of a culture and possibly the entire human species. And the dream is, I'll, ta the, uh, I'll, 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 I'll take a phrase from another psychological psychologist pioneer of the past century sigmund freud that a dream is the royal road to the unconscious and that by understanding these dreams we understand something in the depth of who we are i mean when you it's interesting you use the you use the word skeptic and I guess I am a skeptic, but not a debunker. I'll make a mm -hmm. distinction there. Because it's not bunk. It's something, well, skeptic is from the, 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 the Greek word meaning to examine closely. Something that, I, I, it's so, I, I'm a skeptic in that I'm a, a close examiner, or at least I, I strive to be. And I like to say that the UFO skeptics, those who deny, I'll use that in the more common sense, those who deny 
the phenomenon. They're right about the less important matter. And the believers are right about the more important matter. The skeptics are right. UFOs do not exist. There are no such things in our skies. The believers are right. UFOs are a vitally important subject that need to be taken seriously. Uh, how do you see the mythical lens being important in application? What, what can we learn about ourselves through the phenomenon by applying the mythic lens? First of all, we learn about our perception of death and our awareness of death, death as something utterly alien to us that is at the same time bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. I mean, our death, my death, your death, was born with us, grows up with us, is our companion all our life. And yet, it is so alien that we cannot begin to conceive of what it, what it is. And the UFOs represent that paradox. They also represent something else, and that is our yearning for wholeness. And here I'm drawing heavily on Jung with the idea of the UFO as the mandala, the archetype of wholeness that unites opposites. I keep thinking of those lines from Schiller's Ode to Joy that Beethoven set to unforgettable music. Your magic binds together that which custom strictly divides, and the UFOs do that. It's interesting that uh, uh, I've you have been on my radar before your work, but the reason I reached out to you was uh, the last podcast I had at the end of 2023. I had a guest from the Raelian UFO religion, and uh, one of their major arguments um, is that the word Elohim in Hebrew refers not to God or gods, but to extraterrestrials, and, and they have formed an entire religion around that. So is that an example of, of a myth that loses the, oh, how should we say it, the poetic sense of the myth? To, it, it's almost, I was struck in the conversation. It almost came across as a combination of a science fiction religion, a modern day mythology with almost aspects of fundamentalist Christianity with their eschatology. It, 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 am I correct in that kind of reading of that kind of expression? I uh... Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, 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 I think that's pretty good. Uh, that, w w one of the things that we, when we talk about the Raelians, I mean, they are self-professedly atheistic. There is no God. Mm -hmm. But they are just as creationist as the most rigid fundamentalist that, we did not come into being through evolution. No, evolution is all wrong, right? We came right. into being as the creations of the Elohim who are space beings. And I need to say that although the Raelian scripture exposition is often rather e eccentric, they draw upon the best aspects of the biblical tradition. I mean, I am struck, I think it was Pat, Pat Robertson reads the Pentateuch and comes away with 
uh, UFOs or that there are signs of demonic possession and uh, the Pentateuch says those are to be put to death, <laughs> which is perhaps the worst of the Pentateuchal tradition. The Raelians read that same five books of Moses and what they come up with is that every 50 years there is to be a redistribution of goods and property and that you proclaim freedom throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. So whereas uh, in some ways I would say Raelian biblical exegesis is eccentric, there is also a nobility about it. Also, what's interesting about your work is not only your application of mythology, but your background in the study of Jewish mysticism. So in your experience, you lay aside your interest in UFOs for a while. What led you to that particular area of academic studies, and how then do you circle back to interest in UFOs? Well, I think I knew unconsciously, at least, that I, I hadn't abandoned UFOs at all. I just <laughs> had found a more respectable academic guise for them. The, the book of Ezekiel. And actually, you know, I mean, my fascination with Ezekiel, I read the Bible the first time when I was five years old. And my fascination with Ezekiel began really even before the UFOs uh, that, that I remember coming to my mother and saying, there's this really scary thing in the Bible that this man sees a great wind come out of the north and fire flashing up around it. And I remember looking toward the north of our house and imagining some sort of alien entity coming from there. So that actually when I when I got into UFOs, it was sort of like coming back to Ezekiel because I'm referring to the first chapter of Ezekiel, the vision of the living creatures and the wit and the wheels. And then as a college student, I went back to Ezekiel. As a graduate student, I stayed with Ezekiel, but knowing that it and the UFOs were at bottom the same. Now, when you say same, what unpack that for me? that Ezekiel experiences something which is, I think, strictly speaking, a UFO. But UFOs to me are not extraterrestrial spaceships. They are something from our unconscious which Ezekiel conventionalized as visions of God. And I can dwell on this a little bit more, but I don't want to break off my sentence for too long. Ezekiel <laughs> conventionalized as visions of God because those were the categories available to him, which we conventionalize as spaceships because that's the categories available to us. Do you see, uh, what, what do you see about your your studies, your academic studies that you, you made that connection uh, to the experience of Ezekiel. Did you draw upon any other tools from your background in academic studies that helped you understand in connection with mythology at the same time, understand the UFO phenomenon better? Well, I guess we're staying within the domain of Ezekiel, mm -hmm. but there was a form of early Jewish mysticism called the Ma'ase Merkava, the work of the chariot, the chariot being that of Ezekiel. And it does seem to have involved an experience or a perceived experience of descending into some realms 
that are divine, apparently in some sort of trances. And this seemed to me to be reproduced in the experiences of UFO abductees. That is to say that the abductee remembers having undergone some sort of fantastic journey and is able to recreate it on the hypnotist's couch, which seems to have been akin to what the Yorade Merkava, the descenders to the Merkava, experience experienced and how they recounted their experiences. I mean, and it's interesting. It's an old, old problem. Why they were called the descenders to the Merkava. And by the way, we're not entirely clear just what the historical period was when these people were active. But it seems seems to have been the early centuries of the common era, though possibly as late as the early Middle Ages. Uh, the, 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 but the, uh, and the Merkava, as, as I've said, is the, uh, the, the totality of what Ezekiel saw, what Ezekiel described. And it's an old it's, it, it, it's an old question why, they should be spoken of as descending to it. Because after all, isn't it up there rather than down here? But you do have that sometimes with the UFO abductees that the hypnotist says, you know, they say, "We're well, I'm going down. They're under hypnosis. They're saying, I'm going down. And the hypnotist says, wait a minute, why are you going down? You ought to be going up. I don't know. I don't know. I'm <laughs> just going down. And I think that there we're dealing, what underlies both of this, is a, a representation of going to the unconscious as a descent. I mean, which is literally not true. I mean, we don't go down anywhere. Mm -hmm. when we go when we go into our unconscious but it's the way we envision it mm -hmm. the way we experience it so yeah this this too seemed to me a connection between my academic work and the ufo tradition i remember i was reviewing a book on the precisely on that issue the descenders to the merkava and the author really evaded the question of why the term descent is used. And I remember I wrote in the review that what we need to look for is some sort of an analog, perhaps a modern analog, to their experience, which, in, which is experienced as descent rather than ascent. And I decided it was the better part of valor. Not to say that I thought I knew what those modern analogs were and that they were UFO abductions. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that would have flown in most <laughs> academic journals, at least at least back then. I think now UFOs are becoming more and more respectable as an object of of uh, of scholarly research. You discuss uh, UFO abductions in your book. I, I remember being fascinated by that back in the 1970s. I saw uh, The Interrupted Journey, made for television movie, starring a young James Earl Jones. And uh, later on, I, I read the book uh, that it was based on. I remember reading about the Pascagoula, Mississippi uh, sighting yes. in the 70s as well. 
Um, but likewise, my, my understanding of that phenomenon has changed over the years. Um, in, in fact, I recently read a book by an author who put the Betty and Barney Hill abduction in its social, cultural, and political context. And it was very interesting. You get a very different reading. And uh, in fact, I didn't know back in the 70s when I saw the TV movie that there were, over time, there was a change in their understanding of the story and their experience. Can you talk a little about your exploration of abduction experiences in your book? Well, it seemed to me that the 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 granddaddy of abduction was precisely the Betty and Barney Hill uh, in, in, in incident. And by the way, I would want to put in a plug for that movie, the 1975 TV movie, The UFO Incident, which mm -hmm. is just brilliantly done and also quite authentic. Uh, and it, it struck me that the beginning of the abduction phenomenon was from a mixed race couple. And it also struck me, and it struck some others as well, that the experience of abduction replicates that of Barney Hill's ancestors being abducted onto an alien ship and taken into an alien. I cannot avoid using that word over and over, an alien and terrifying world. And it seemed to me that paradoxically, that quintessentially Black ancestral experience became the experience of overwhelmingly white men and women, the inheritors of the culture that performed the original crime of abduction. I mean, you mentioned Pascagoula, which is 1973. And that is, to me, in many ways, and who find themselves being fished for by a greater fish. And I, that they, they, they well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. It's clear that they were not literally abducted by a flying saucer. If there had been a low-flying UFO in that area, hundreds of others would have seen it. They did, no, no one but these two men experienced it. And it's natural to suppose that they invented it. The only thing is that when they were, they went to the police station to report it, the police put them in a room by themselves and unknown to them with a hidden tape recorder. And they started talking between themselves. And from their conversation, it's clear that they've undergone an experience that they don't understand and that's overwhelming. And one of them says to the other about the UFO, they could have they could have had a son. They owned us. And I think bingo. This is a man from a part of the country where people did own other people. And which in 1973, the scars of the struggle over some sort of equality were still fresh. So the, I think the, yeah, the, the the Betty and Barney Hill case that became almost a template for all future oh, yeah. types of oh yeah 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 that's a, that's exactly my point that the 
that the experience that Betty and Barney have of being kidnapped the way Barney's ancestors surely had been became the template for hundreds, conceivably thousands of white Americans who felt themselves experiencing the same thing. You see that as kind of a processing a mechanism, a, a mythological construct that allows folks to process certain ex experiences for themselves? Perhaps process, perhaps a tone. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, coming back to, to, to the two men at Pascagoula, that the 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 really baffling thing is how did they construct what seems to have been a shared experience of the alien the uncanny the numinous without without there being an actual physical basis for it and that it's striking in their account that they imagine the that they keep saying that the opening i don't understand the opening of that ship and the opening as they describe it well they use the image of sort of like a change purse being opened which i would see as like a fish's mouth opening and i think here there's a sort of poetic justice that two men go out to catch fish and are fished for by a greater fish. Perhaps this also is an analogy to what we did to Black people in this country. We abducted them and use them at will, dehumanizing them. And now we, the abductees, are experiencing the same from an alien culture that's beyond our understanding. I mean, I, I'm going to be the first to say that all oh, this is speculation. Mm -hmm. I think I, I I think that the connections are real and can be established, but interpreting the connections leads us into speculation. And perhaps the future science of ufology is to find some way of moving these speculations into testable hypotheses. Well, let's hope that there is a future science of ufology, that it's uh, an area of interest for both of us is uh, taking on new dimensions. Let me get your take on an interesting quote from uh, a Harvard professor in November of last year. He's the head of the Galileo Project. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Maybe you were familiar with him. Avi Loeb, L-O-E-B. Uh, he said this, quote, extraterrestrials could save humanity. The geopolitical world we live in needs repair. Throughout history, humans hoped for a messianic age of peace and prosperity. My take is that the Messiah will not arrive riding on a donkey, as suggested in Zechariah 9.9, but instead might be riding on a space spacecraft from an exoplanet, close quote. I find that fascinating, and I'm reminded of a, an article that Michael Shermer wrote for Scientific American titled Belief in Aliens May Be a Religious Impulse. So if your idea is correct that this really is a mythology, it's not just for quote-unquote religious people or religiously oriented people. It's for skeptics and scientists alike, is it not? Atheists. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it was Michael who, uh, who remarked that, that, at least according to surveys, that 
atheists are more likely to believe in extraterrestrial life than religious believers, which may perhaps suggest that the two occupy similar slots. I, 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 I think I, I always pronounce it Loeb, Avi Loeb. Is it Loeb? Okay. I, 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 well, I'm not sure. I, I'm not <laughs> sure. D don't stand corrected. It may be, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing just as you are, Avi Loeb. But he, I, I don't think I've ever heard it pronounced. But he's kind of an odd character. And I don't know quite what to make of him. Because his initial book, which I think was called Extraterrestrial, came out, if I recall correctly, around the beginning of 2020. Uh, and it's it's about this Oumuamua, this object, mysterious object that entered the solar system that Loeb and practically no one else thinks was an extraterrestrial probe. Now, what is remarkable is that in that book, there is not a word about UFOs. Mm. Since then, <laughs> and now that UFOs have really caught on, now that UFOs have really caught on, now Loeb has established his Galileo project to try to find solid infl solid evidence for the UFOs, which in my, as you realize, in my opinion, is looking in precisely the wrong direction, mm -hmm. looking out there, whereas we ought to be looking in here. But I think that the, the I, I mentioned the beginning of 2020, I hope I have that right, because what happened in 2020 was we endured an actual alien invasion. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the corona, the, 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 the image of a pandemic as an alien invasion uh, goes back to, goes back very far. Who, who was the writer? I cannot remember. It's John something or other who wrote about the uh, the flu epidemic in in, in, in 19, 1918, 1919. And he falls quite naturally into the language of H.G. Wells and the War of the Worlds, the, the Martian invasion in describing it. And I think that that is the latest element in the development of UFOs, our genuine encounter with a, a quite terrifying alien invader. Well, I think a good way to wrap up our conversation is to get your thoughts on where we are at present with this renewed interest in UFOs. We've got... Uh, congressional hearings, we've got military personnel seeing things and taking video and so on. Of course, the, the interpretation is we'll see. And this, we're not saying it's extraterrestrials. It might be something from another government, but it certainly has led to a resurgence of interest in the possibility of extraterrestrials. What do you see, uh, if you were to look into your uh, crystal ball of Jewish mysticism, what would you see for the, the near future of UFO studies and its impact on, on culture and well, mythology, do you, do you hope it'll continue to maybe gain some more traction in helping us understand it? Well, at first I was going to fob you off with a quotation <laughs> from Gershom Scholem, who died in 1982, but he was the modernity's greatest scholar of Jewish mysticism. And he said at the end of his uh, magnum opus, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, he says that what's going to happen, how Jewish mysticism will unfold in the coming decades, centuries, that is a task for prophets and not professors. <laughs> I am a mere professor. So I was going 
to dismiss you with that. <laughs> but I will I will say, first of all, I am absolutely convinced UFOs are not going away. Uh, I think they will get more traction of different sorts. To me, the most, really, the epical event about in UFO history, 21st century UFO history, was December 2017 when the New York Times ran two front page articles on UFOs, highly sympathetic. That is such a total reversal of where the Times or always stood. So that here the new the nation's newspaper of record has become almost unabashedly pro UFO, which to me is a seismic shift and uh, 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 of cultural importance. I mean, I really don't expect a UFO invasion <laughs> in the lit in the literal sense, but this is about the closest thing we're going to get to it. So I think that you so that my my crystal ball will say that UFOs will continue. They will take different forms, perhaps new spin-offs of myth like the alien of like the abduction tradition in the late 20th century will come into being. It will grow, it will shift. I do not think we will ever understand it as a culture the way I'm suggesting we understand it. Because when myth becomes traced to its real sources, it loses much of its power. It has to keep its mythical garb. And perhaps what I would, what I like to do, what I hope I did in my book is to keep the mythical garb and at the same time understand the roots of the myth. Well, I appreciate that, David. And thanks for not just closing with uh, a quote, <laughs> but uh, entertaining uh, my, my question there. Uh, I hope it does have uh, a great future. For a while there, it just kind of seemed like it was going to continue to be nothing but fringe when those of us who like to study fringe phenomenon, but uh, it looks like it's got some some new legs uh, and some new power going into the future. So uh, let me hold up a cover of your book. We'll have information about this book and a link to the book and a link to uh, David's uh, uh, website. And uh, I encourage folks to seek that out. David, thank you so much for coming on the program and sharing. Well, thank you so much for having me, John. It was a pleasure. Thank you again. Until the next episode of Multi-Faith Matters, thanks for watching and listening.